This episode is brought to you by ARX. You want to be a successful strength training studio owner. The problem is you aren't able to deliver the safest, most efficient and effective workouts, making it harder for you to attract and retain clients, which makes you feel frustrated. I understand that it can be difficult to differentiate your business without the right tools. ARX's breakthrough adaptive resistance technology uses patented motorized resistance and computer software to give you and your clients the perfect workout every single time. BioFit founder John Zarbock says that ARX is clearly the superior tool to deliver the exercise stimulus. My clients are seeing insane improvements in weeks, not months. I could not fathom running my business without ARX. So here's how you get started. Number one, go to arxfit.com forward slash HIB to get $500 off your ARX machines. Number two, book a call with the ARX sales team. And number three, learn how ARX can help you grow your strength training business. Go to arxfit.com forward slash HIB so you can stop struggling to attract and retain clients and start to grow your strength training business with confidence. Lauren Snow here and welcome back to highintensitybusiness.com, the podcast where we discuss high intensity strength training and provide you with the tools, the tactics and the strategies to help you grow your strength training business. This is episode 340 and in today's podcast, I'm talking to Dr. James Steele, who's been on the podcast a bunch of times. We're going to be talking about what he's discovered during big data meta-analysis, comparing resistance training interventions with non-training control groups and much, much more. James, welcome back to the podcast. Pleasure as always, Lawrence. Great to have you. So, um, you know, we were, we were chatting on Facebook relatively recently and we were talking about stuff we could talk about on the podcast. And I was really surprised to see you working on something that was really interesting to both you and myself. And that's this, this big data meta-analysis that you spoke of. Um, and I just love to you just to open up with that and talk about, you know, what is that, what does that mean? What is that about? And what, what have you been, what have you discovered so far? Yeah, sure. So probably, I mean, most most listeners I'm sure will have heard of, you know, the term meta-analyses and and I guess to give a very quick overview of that for those who aren't familiar, meta meta analytic approaches are essentially approaches to kind of like taking study level data and synthesizing it quantitatively and combining it. Um, and it, 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 to be fair, meta analytic approaches, um, statistical modeling, and and in that area is far more kind of like flexible and. Um, complicated than what most people I imagine in sort of like sport and exercise are familiar with. Um, and it's actually through sort of like my um, getting to, to grips a little bit more with some more complicated sort of like an interesting approaches to using meta-analyses that sort of led me down this this current project that I'm working on. Um, so uh, th- this project in particular, like most people will be familiar with sort of um, looking at meta-analyses to um, Look at, for example, the effects of treatment A or intervention A versus intervention B. Like, you know, does, um, you know, does do does high volume beat low volume? You know, does heavy loads beat light loads? And you know, what are the comparative sort of like effects on outcomes from them? But you can actually also use um, meta analyses to compare not only the sort of mean effects of different interventions, but also the variation in interventions as well. Um, and this is what kind of like led me down uh, this route because an area that I've been sort of interested in for a number of years is this idea of inter-individual response variation. Um, and I think we actually did a podcast, or we spoke about this probably on a podcast years ago. Um, and my thinking has definitely evolved a lot since then. And I, and I would go so far as saying that that probably what I've said on previous podcasts, I would now disagree with. Um Now, I I guess to begin with, it's worth saying that what I am going to say is not um, that there is no such thing as inter-individual response variation. I mean, you don't need a scientific study to to say that some people respond better than others. Um, But whether or not within the context of a study, we can identify that inter-individual response variation to interventions is is a very different question. 
And this is essentially what I've been interested in looking at with this. So one approach to looking at response variation is to um, essentially look at how much variance um, in the change in, say, an outcome. So like, say you do a study that you want to measure strength. Um, you'll measure it before the intervention. You'll measure it after the intervention. Um, and if it's a randomized controlled trial, you'll have two groups. You'll have an intervention group and you'll have a control group. And usually the control group doesn't do anything, particularly in resistance training studies like, like uh, in our field. Um, but for both groups, you'll measure, say, strength or hypertrophy before and after the intervention. Now, in the control group, you will still see that on an individual basis, people's scores change. And there's a number of reasons for, for that. You know, there's uh, just random within participant variation, there's measurement error, and there's all sorts of kind of other confounding variables. But none of them are due to the intervention because they didn't get the intervention. Um, and they were randomized to not get the intervention. So we kind of control for, for any confounding variables around that. Um, so what you'll see is there will be variation in the changes that you see in that control group. Now, what we can do is we can look at the variation in changes in the intervention group and compare that to the control group. Now, if the intervention was introducing additional variation, that's to say that, that introducing the intervention increases the amount to which people's responses vary, then we would expect to see that the variation in the intervention group is bigger than in the control group. Follow me? Yep, go ahead. Okay, good stuff. So what this means is that that really simple designs where you have a control group and an intervention group mean that you can explore to some extent, like it's not it's not the best approach to doing this, but unfortunately the best approach to doing this is something that we probably can't can't do in our field because it requires um, what's called replicated randomized crossover trials. And um, it's very difficult to figure out how long the washout periods should be and things like that for things like inter exercise interventions. So this is probably kind of the best we've got at the moment. Um, so what I, I thought this for a while, I thought what would be really cool is when I came across this idea that you can do a meta-analysis comparing those, those that variation between, say, control groups and intervention groups, um, is it would be really cool at some point to go back and try and find as many studies as possible um, that have that compared a resistance training intervention to a control group. Um, and actually, uh, earlier this year, there was a meta-analysis published, which had included just those kinds of studies. Um, so it saved me the trouble of having to do a big systematic search myself. Um, and they had just over 100 studies in their meta-analyses. And so what I did was I got hold of a list of all of those studies. Um, and over the last sort of four or five months, I've been slowly going through those studies and extracting the data uh, from those studies to do this, this comparison and basically see... Um, using a meta-analytic model to compare the variation between the intervention and the control group, whether or not there was additional variation introduced by the uh, randomization to the intervention group. Um, so that's what I've been working on. Um, and it's it's it, obviously we've, we've, I've got an interesting uh, answer to that. And actually um, what I'm going to be doing with that paper is um, is working with a statistician who has developed a lot of um, the techniques in this area to put together a kind of tutorial paper for our field. Because, you know, most people up until about, you know, a year or two ago, I wasn't even aware that you could do these kinds of meta-analyses um, and I'd never seen them in our field. Um, and so it seems as though our field and, and most of the people I speak to aren't aware that it's a technique that can be used. Um, so we're going to be using this data set to essentially write a kind of tutorial paper introducing other researchers to this is something you can do um, when looking at interventions and, and that kind of thing. Um, but obviously, from our perspective, the substantive questions are, are, are answers are, uh, are probably of more interest here. So most people will probably be thinking, well, you know, what, what were the results then? Like, what was the uh, uh, what were the findings? <laughs> um, and um, interestingly enough, there is um, not very much evidence that there is um, what we would consider to be true inter-individual response variation um, to resistance training. And so basically what that means is, um, the intervention, the variation in change in strength or hypertrophy as a result of the intervention um, does not exceed that what that which you would see from just a non-training control group. Um, and now, so to go back to what I said to begin with, that doesn't mean I'm saying there is no inter-individual response variation. But what it means is that unless we have greater variation 
in the intervention group, we can't partition out the sources of variation, which then kind of puts almost a hard stop on all of the kind of precision medicine kind of ideas of saying, well, can we predict whether this person is a high responder or this person is a low responder or the extent to which different individuals are likely to respond, given we know certain characteristics about the individuals? Because any studies that look to try and identify those predictors of responsiveness aren't able to tell whether or not they're, they're, those predictors are predicting true response variation or they're just predicting noise. Um, and so it's interesting thing because I think there's a, yeah, there's a on, kind of... I'm going to need to stop you there because you lost me, James. Sure. Like the last... <laughs> The last 30 seconds, I was like, okay, he's going to say something that's going to help me make sense of this. But can you do your best? And if I just don't get it, we'll move on. But can you do your best to like try to simplify the last 60 seconds? Because I, sure. I, I'm, I'm not quite following you. And I might come in with questions as we go. So maybe one way to think about it is like this. So go back to the idea of the control group. And like I said, if I, if I measured you now and I measured you in 12 weeks' time, um, your scores are very unlikely to be exactly the same for a whole host of different reasons, you know, just random fluctuations, measurement error, regression to the mean, all of these. There's variation that will Got affect that. those scores that mean they won't be the same. So if you take a, big, a group of people and you did that and you um, calculated like the standard deviation of their change scores, you'd see that there's some variation around it. So on average, it's going to be zero. Nothing's happened. Nothing changes. But there'll still be some variation. Now, imagine you collected a bunch of um, data at baseline, like, I don't know, anthropometric characteristics, um, even genetic, you know, uh, um, predictors and things like that. And you try to use that data to predict who would have a high of response and who would have a low response. Well, you kind of say to me, well, that's daft, James, because you're, all you're doing is predicting noise. Like they didn't get an intervention. So how can you say that even if we found a model that found some significant prediction, you know, correlations and, uh, and, and um, that some of these factors did significantly predict it, you would know that it's a stupid question to ask, uh, to ask in the first place, because we know that all we're doing is predicting noise. Now, look at it from this perspective. If you have a intervention group that has the same amount or less variation, then you can't tell in that instance as well whether or not the predictors are predicting the noise or whether Got they're it. predicting the variation that's been introduced by the intervention because it's evidently not big enough to exceed the noise okay, that you so just the, get the, from the, the statistically not powerful enough to, to say that the intervention is what caused the change. Not, not quite. No, it's not necessarily about, about power because you can still detect whether the intervention has produced a mean increase, but it's whether or not you can predict on the individual level um, whether someone's going to increase, how much they're going to increase, decrease, et cetera, et cetera because um, their individual scores will be the mean score plus the, the noise that you're that you would get right. from just all of those factors anyway when you factor that all in it's not as much variation or no variation in your is that what you're saying essentially yeah so essentially what we're saying is that the intervention doesn't seem if anything actually the intervention seems to reduce the variation that you see um and it's really not clear why that is the case um but if anything um what, what you essentially, in an ideal world, what you would need to see is the control group has, say, this much inter, uh, variance, and the intervention has this much intervariance. And then what you can say is, well, this extra variance is what is introduced by the intervention. So we can take away that. We're left with some variance that's just due to how people respond to the intervention. And that's what we want to predict, because we don't care about whether or not you know whether we can predict all these noisy factors that that um you know we don't we aren't interested in um okay. so yeah so uh, i mean to put it because i i think the whole particularly in i i don't know i'm going to make an assumption here you know a lot of a lot of uh you know the uh listeners to this podcast are probably interested in in all of the i don't know what it's called nowadays quantified self kind of you know that that kind of movement the biohacking or what what was the what's the current kind of quantified uh, self i don't know it's probably <laughs> it's probably like the way to put it biohacking yeah kind of, that kind of sort of stuff there. and and that's very much kind of like to, to, at least in my mind like tied into the whole sort of like precision medicine movement you know being able to track these metrics and use them to predict this and predict that um 
in this circumstance, what it really says is it's kind of a non-starter. Like you can't, it's not going to be able to predict anything that's going to be actually useful. Um, now, that, that seems pretty sort of like, oh, well, that's a bit depressing. That's a bit like, oh, I was hoping we would be able to, you know, eventually get to the point where we could provide these kind of, you know, individualized prescriptions that we know are going to be better for this and better for that, better for this individual and better for that individual. Um, and that's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it, though, is to say, well, this, this meta-analysis that I've done, because I've also used this data set to do a traditional meta-analysis, which is to say, well, compared to doing nothing, does resistance training increase strength? Does it increase muscle mass? And like, it's no shock to anyone. Yes, it does. Like, and, and the effects are very, very clear. They're very, very consistent. And that's what this analysis shows as well, is that the fact that there is um, less variation in responses after taking part in the intervention means that not only do we see that there's a mean effect but we can be pretty damn sure that the vast majority of people respond very well to resistance training in hang terms on, of hang on, this is all starting to click for me now james it's all starting to click um so you're saying that what what you often so what you when you look at like the sample in a study and you might see big differences between individuals in the state, well, when in, in your work, because it's big data meta analysis, you are seeing you're seeing so many more individuals, and that's where you're basically seeing that there's not much variation between people in terms of the intervention. So then that's leading you to conclude that not a lot of these interventions matter. It almost doesn't matter what you do, the ver the results are going to be similar. Is that a fair thing to say or is that totally incorrect not not quite no because it doesn't matter whether you've got big data or small data every individual data point is going to be subject to all of those kind of confounding factors that introduce noise that we're not interested in um plus the intervention uh, intervention effects if it's in an intervention group the key is having the ability to quantify the noise um, that is not due to the the, the variance that's not due to the intervention and how much variance the intervention adds to it. So that's what I mean by saying, like, you need these, you need a control group, you need a group that does nothing to see how much just normal variation you see in their chain in their uh, changes. If if the intervention, if you then looked at the changes after the intervention in that group and the variance was bigger, then that would suggest that the, the intervention has introduced additional variance. It means that some people are responding more, some people are responding less. Um, it's not just that, um, you know, the, all of the, the noisy variables that are involved in the control groups change scores are causing this variation. It's that something else is causing additional variation. And we don't know exactly um, what might help us predict that or not um, on the individual basis, but you need to have that additional variation that's been introduced by the intervention to be able to even get to the stage where you can start asking questions well i wonder what so, what predicts it so okay so is it, it, it so just so i understand try and understand this then is it is it that there are there are differences between the the intervention group and the control group but it's we don't understand what's causing the difference what's contributing to it so let me try and think of the best way to, way to put this. The so, listeners are like, Lawrence, we understand. James <laughs> yeah. has been so So imagine clear. you've got two things that we could be <laughs> interested in. You've got how much does the, um, what's the difference in the mean changes between the control group and the intervention group? Um, and that's what we normally look at. Like on average, how much does the intervention go up? On average, how much does the control group go up? Well, normally the control group doesn't doesn't go up at all. The average is zero and the intervention is whatever, you know, whatever depends on what you're measuring. But it's normally more than zero. Normally, most of the time we see that, that resistance training interventions do increase strength, increase hypertrophy compared to a control group. But they're the mean scores. Now, there's that mean score is comprised, comprised of all the individual data in each of those groups to which there is obviously variation. Now, you can compare the two mean scores, but you can compare the variation in those groups as well. And that's what we're talking about here. We're saying, how much uh, does the variation in the change scores in the control group or the intervention group compare with one, one another? Um, so, yes. That's what confuses me, though, because you're saying there, there isn't much, there isn't any evidence of a difference, right? Whereas exactly. then in an, in, but on the other hand, you're saying, we know that 
we know that an intervention like resistance training improves strength and hypertrophy. So there is a difference. So this is where I, I, I can't, how do you reconcile that? Or am you, I, you're, ahead. you're confusing what you're talking about. You're thinking of difference as being a difference in the change score. You're, you're, you need to get out of the mindset that you're thinking of the difference as being like how much the average goes up. Like what, so, so, you know, so look, look at my hands. Like, let's say these are two means. This is the intervention. This is the control group. This is zero. This is whatever, a hundred. But each of those data points will have variation around, around them. Now, if it, I look at the size of my fingers, like this one is half as big as this one, one now. So we would say that there is more variation here. Even if the, me I mean, even if the means were the same, you could have one with this much, one with that much variation. We can compare, we don't have to limit ourselves to comparing the mean changes. We can compare the variance in those cha changes. Um, and that's what we're talking about here. We're, we're actually doing both in the, in the analysis that I've been doing. I've compared the mean changes and yes, resistance training increases strength, increases hypertrophy, but resistance training does not produce greater variance in the change in uh, strength or the change in hypertrophy compared to just the variance in those, those measurements as a result of doing nothing. Um, and so I guess to kind of like try and wrap up like what that means is um, it does mean that if you give, if you give someone an, a resistance training intervention, you can be pretty damn sure that not only will they increase, but that it doesn't kind of matter who you give the intervention to the vast majority of people improve and fairly consistently as a result of it because we've got a mean change and we've also got no difference in the variation um so it means that on average everyone responds pretty much similarly to it now i, I mean as we know that's not really the case and that's not exa quite exactly what we're say saying here um what we're really say saying is that the the variance in in response to the, the intervention is just not as big as we think it is. Does that make sense? Kind of. Yeah, I'm getting there, James. I think I'm going to have to re-listen to that last 30 minutes of conversation. But I mean, fine. this is a tough topic. Like, this, <laughs> like, I speak to other colleagues and researchers in the field who also struggle to get this um so this is <laughs> like this is this is high level stuff for even like other other researchers no but on a serious note i do one thing i, I have, have have had to do with our podcast before is re-listen with a notepad and like work it through and then it clicks and i get it um and that's the, the purpose of this podcast is is not to go oh look at me i'm so knowledgeable it's to say because <laughs> i'm really not it's to have people like you on and, and use it for a learning experience for myself as much as it is for obviously everyone that tunes in so no i really appreciate it um no okay so um what's the next thing you wanted to jump onto or have you sorry have you got more to say on on that because uh, no i think that's kind of covered, covered it there there but i think i think it does kind of naturally lead on to uh, to the the other point which i think is interesting because this is like i say like i i went into this interested in comparing the variance um but um because we're putting together this kind of tutorial paper one of the things we started off by doing was i thought well the first thing to do would be to take this big data set 100 plus studies you know it's over 5,000 people uh, it's worth of data and um, having done resistance training or control groups i said well let's first present show like, well, you can do a normal meta-analysis comparing those mean scores um, and show people like, yeah, this is what you can do, but this is what you can additionally do. So I went ahead and did that, that traditional meta-analysis on this data set as well. And that kind of independently of, of the points of purpose of putting this kind of tutorial paper together, that then kind of, a, a light bulb went off in my mind when I did that, that analysis because this this is this is the interesting thing so we can often when we do these kinds of meta analyses we will um calculate the effects um using what's called a standardized effect size um and the reason we do this is because different studies will use different measurement outcomes and stuff like that and you and they're all on different slightly different units you know like like everyone will know like saying like i went from 100 kilos to 150 kilos on the, my leg press like begs the question of like well i don't know if that's a lot or not because what leg press were you using like uh, so and it's the same sort of thing there'll be different ways of measuring hypertrophy mri ct ultrasound there'll be different ways of measuring strength one rm isometric you know isokinetic etc um so what we'll often do is if we want to kind of be able to pull across different studies we will um calculate these standardized effect sizes and 
in a nutshell, all they do is they convert the changes that we're looking at or the differences between the, the groups that we're looking at into standard deviation units. So you can kind of, basically it says like, well, if at baseline um, people's, uh, you know, mean score was whatever, um, what we're saying is that if they had a, if the effect size was one, it would mean that they increased by one standard deviation. So they've gone, they've moved up, uh, across by one standard deviation from their baseline. And you can convert these to percentiles, you can convert them to Z scores and all these different different things. But that's all it really, really means. And, and what I'll do is I'll kind of, I'll, I'll, get, I'll, I'll make this a little bit clearer by uh, kind of converting um, this into something called the common language effect size in a moment for you. Um, but anyway, so what I did was I pulled all of the kind of broad strength outcomes in this, in this um, and I pulled all of the kind of broad hypertrophy outcomes. So, you know, literal like increases in cross-sectional area, muscle size, uh, thickness, lean mass, et cetera. Um, pulled all of this data together and calculated what the standardized mean difference between resistance training versus control groups. So what this is, is to put it in my layman's terms, is saying, what is the effect of resistance training compared to doing nothing? Like, and that, that's simply it. When we look at um, strength outcomes, the effect size that we see is 0.9. So what it's saying is compared to doing nothing, resistance training increases your strength by 0.9 of a standard deviation. Okay. For hypertrophy, it's 0.4. Now, these are surprisingly small. Um, and I think there's a few reasons for that. Um, one is is kind of goes back to, as I say, you know, we were talking before this about some of the issues in our field in terms of statistical illiteracy. And I'll be, I'm, I'm, I'm not sort of like trying to be nasty by saying this because I, all of the mistakes that I notice people making now, I notice because I used to make all those mistakes. Um, and one of them, for example, is calculating these effect sizes incorrectly. And there's a lot of different ways they can be uh, calculated. And oftentimes people will calculate them not quite right. And so it's common to see in uh, resistance training studies, like effect sizes of like 1.2 or 1.4 or even two, like re really quite big effect size sizes. Um, so when I first saw these, I thought, oh, they seem really small. And that's interesting because most of these studies that you look at don't have control groups. They're comparing, say, high load versus low load training. Um, and so if I'm only seeing, say, a 0.9 or a 0.4 for resistance training versus doing nothing, then these seem very small compared to these other studies. Um, but that's you know the, the, the realization that, that people are probably calculating them incorrectly. Um, another way of thinking of it, though, is... Um, at least in psychology, and our field still uses these, and it's questionable whether they're appropriate or not, but they have some crude thresholds that they use to interpret them. Um, and so kind of qualitatively, you would label based on uh, what are called Cohen's thresholds. Um, a 0.9 would be considered a quote-unquote large effect, um, and a 0.4 would be considered a quote-unquote small effect. Um, but and this is the kind of this is where I think it's like easier to understand than this for the layperson particularly. And interestingly, there's actually some research that shows that it's easier to understand effect sizes when you present them this way. Um, we can convert these into this common language effect size idea. Um, so if you imagine um, that you do the intervention, and um, at the end of the intervention, you know you have um, the control group strength values and the uh, intervention group strength values. Um, and because we know the intervention works, on average, the you know the control the intervention group are going to be stronger than the control group after the intervention because um, the control group didn't do the intervention. What you can do is you can calculate the probability that if you randomly picked someone from the intervention group and randomly picked someone from the control group what's the probability that the intervention person would be stronger than the control person? Now, when you convert 0.9 into a, a 0.9 effect size into this probability, it's only about 73%. So, I mean, that's quite good. Like there's a 70, after the intervention, there's a 73% chance that you'll be stronger than someone who's not done resistance training. 
But actually, when you think about that, you go, huh, that actually isn't quite as impressive as I thought it would be. And it still leaves a 27% chance that I'll still be weaker than someone who's so never lifted it, a weight. So let's life. just put in another, no, I think that's fascinating. So put in another way, it's like for every 100 people you meet, 27 of them who have never even touched a barbell are going to be stronger than you. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, and and to put it in perspective even more for hypertrophy outcomes as being 0.4 effect size, um, that converts to about 61% probability of superiority. So again, like, you know, 39% of people you bump into who have never picked up a weight in their life will probably still be bigger than you. Yeah, that's it. I remember this is, this takes me back to a conversation I had with Simon Shawcross like years ago. And um, we were talking about, you know, I was asking him, and this is before I, not that I know anything now, but this is before I really knew anything about this stuff. And um, I said to him, like, have you ever met anyone who's like really, really small, like not very muscular, maybe lean, who's a lot stronger than like someone who's really large? And Simon was just like, no, like, you know, not, I mean, I'm not trying to correlate hypertrophy and strength. That's a completely different discussion. But um, he's like, no, I, I, you know, people that are much more muscular, you know, like, this is actually this is I'm, I'm starting to think this point is irrelevant because we're talking about the size of the individual but um i think the, the the thing we were trying to we were talking about was the amount of times that simon said like there's people on the street who've never you know touched a weight who are just very muscular or big or whatever who just exhibit that kind of strength straight away and then having not done any any sort of training and you know rest of us can be training for decades and never reach that level and it's i just find it quite quite funny really um but no, yeah. it's um, well, go ahead. Well, yeah. I mean, like, um, well, my, uh, like, you yeah, know, a, a, a good example that comes to mind for me is um, my, uh, well, now uh, he's he's graduated now. So uh, my previous PhD student, Pac, uh, Dr. Andrew Lakis Korokakis, he's, he's, um, he's also a, a, a very accomplished powerlifting coach and powerlifter himself. But he, um, he started training um, a guy in his 40s. Um, the, the, the lifter was in his 40s who had never i mean he'd done a little bit of resistance training but he'd never like power lifted or anything like that um and you know he went from barely having touched a weight to uh being like british record holder in in the deadlift and uh, you know in a very short space based at time um but even then like like before he even started training the first thing he did he went in just just you know outlifted most people in the gym like he was already a strong dude yeah yeah it is quite it is a little bit uh, a hit to the ego when you take someone for a workout and you're like wow you are you are pushing more weight than me and i've been doing this for like over 10 years and this is your first workout like ever <laughs> like, yeah. i must say for myself that doesn't happen too often but that's probably because my sample size is too small <laughs> i'm sure it's going to happen <laughs> a lot more in the future um so is it is it fair to say that you know pretty much we, i mean most of us know this right that genetics are the main thing here that's not you know they're going to determine most you know most of these things you're 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 you know the amount of muscle you hold and the strength that you have and, and the reality is that these interventions whilst they obviously do um they do have a lot of benefits and uh, you know will will increase one strength and and muscle mass to a degree for for for, for most people um there's just there's just other individuals out there who are just genetically just going to be superior to you and that's not you know we i think sometimes we maybe understate just how uh, important genetics are. Is that a fair fair comment with this in mind? Yeah, absolutely. And and I guess it's it's worth kind of clarifying when we're talking about this, you know, thinking about the previous conversation about response variation, we are talking about um, the influence of genetics on kind of between person variation even before you start an intervention. Like, like yes, there will be a huge amount of, vari like between person variance kind of like really dominates this. And it's one of the things that, makes um research in this field so hard because it means that you need massive sample sizes to really explore um most things um and particularly because actually you know we'll, we'll kind of go on to this in a minute i guess um the fact that we're, we're realistically trying to identify very small effects if they exist at all anyway um particularly when we go on to talking about like comparing different interventions um but yeah, like we're saying, saying you know, you, you, at baseline, genetics will kind of determine strength. And, um, you know, if you're strong to begin with, you're going to be strong after an intervention and you're, you're going to be stronger, but you're still going to be strong relative to the, you know, the rest of the population. Um, it doesn't. And, and while I think, yes, like um, 
genetics probably do determine uh, the extent to which people do respond to it. Like I said, I think that um, individual response to training is um, a lot smaller than we uh, than we think it is. At least it's smaller than you know all the other kind of noisy things that are introduced into our measurements. Yeah, it's amazing because it just makes me think of all the the mainstream media, fitness models, Instagram, social media, where we have this huge selection bias where we're seeing all these very muscular individuals and we associate, oh, they must do strength training. And it's like, yes, okay, they do do that, but it's, it's you know, uh, their results are largely a result of their the genetic hand they were dealt. And it's, I just, what I'm trying to say is I think when we see all of those images and we saw that media, we, we, we think it just strengthens our view that the intervention is far more powerful than it really is. Right. And it's like, it's not helpful. It's not valuable. It's not the truth. And, you know, you, even myself, it's like, I, I, I know better yet. I see all this and it still makes me think that. And then I talk to someone like you and it's like, oh, you're actually doing really rigorous research to show actually, you know what, it's the, you know, the, what am I trying to say? The, um, these interventions aren't as powerful, at least from a hypertrophy and strength perspective as the, as our culture would, would have you think. And it's just a helpful reminder. And it's not like, I don't want, this is the thing, right, James, like we, you and I, it's funny because we we sound like almost we're being nihilistic about strength training, but we're, we're like the most passionate people about this stuff, and we strength train all the time. We love it, and we love nerding out about it. But but at the same time, we we want to we're interested in what's true. And as being a scientist, you're always looking for better explanations for reality, right? And so that's just this is just where where it takes us, and you have to look at everything objectively, or at least try to. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I think uh, to some extent, like. Yeah, it's like I said, say, you know, you can, <laughs> you could be quite nihilistic about, about this and say, say, oh, well, it's not as, it's not anywhere near as impressive as we think it is. Actually, I guess it depends on what you use to compare it to, because the vast majority of interventions have such small, um, you know, particularly these kinds of behavioral interventions have tiny effects in the first place. So compared to most things, like this is almost one of the things we can be damn sure actually works. It might not like, you know, it, it, I mean, it's definitely not going to turn everyone into, you know, bodybuilders or even sort of, you know, noticeably like, uh, you know, um, bigger or stronger or, or, or whatever in most cases, but it does work. And, um, I, I think as well, like I, um, <laughs> the, the, uh, have you seen the whole sort of like sharp nerd memes? Like, uh, oh, good. so, so I sometimes think about this because like you say, you know, I, I, we enjoy geeking out about this stuff and, um, but, but I, um, actually it's a little bit like, um, you see those memes of like the bell curve and on the one end you've got kind of like the guy going like, Oh, it doesn't matter. Do whatever. And in the middle, you've got the like angry guy with the glasses kind of going like, no, it has to be evidence-based. Like, ah, I must upregulate my mTOR. <laughs> and then on the other end, you've got the guy going like, ah, oh, just do what, like in the cloak kind of like going, don't worry. It doesn't matter. Just do whatever. <laughs> and I kind of feel gotcha. like that sometimes now it's like, do you know what? Like by and large, it doesn't. Um, and so other things are far more important for dictating um, what you decide to do and why you decide, decide to do it. And like, yeah, we love, we love resistance training, training. We love doing, doing it. Um, we get some benefits out of it. But for me, it's almost more than that now. Like it's uh, like, I just like the phenomenology of it, the experience, like, like it's just something I do. It's something I enjoy. It's something I love, love you know, I don't know why. Um, it's like, well, I, I, start playing golf again recently why do i play golf i don't know i like it <laughs> i enjoy it <laughs> who cares why this episode is brought to you by arx these are the most intense exercise machines i've ever used i remember how fast the pull down exercise took me to muscular failure and beyond on the final negative or eccentric excursion, my tank was practically empty, but the adaptive resistance enabled me to continue to perform work until the predetermined end of the set. This experience was very profound and made me realize how effective ARX is in helping clients reach a high level of intensity in their workouts and ultimately produce the best results. 
I also love how ARX measures and tracks range of motion, rep cadence, total output and time, and more with real-time audio and visual feedback. These features are powerful sales and retention tools to help you convert and keep more clients. As a listener of the High Intensity Business Podcast, ARX is offering you $500 off your machines. Just go to arxfits.com forward slash HIB to book a call with the ARX sales team to learn how ARX can revolutionize and grow your fitness business. Again, go to arxfits.com forward slash HIB and now back to the episode. And that's a point you made there about, we know it does work. We know that these strength training interventions do improve strength, hypertrophy, tons of other markers of health that we, we're probably not going to talk about in this podcast. But the, were you kind of saying in, in a way there that there's a lot of other things that we think work, but they have no effect and we just don't have the research to, well, maybe the current research doesn't prove that they have an effect and we just don't maybe have a rigorous scientist around like you who are willing to really do the type of research on other interventions outside. Like if we're just keeping within kind of health and fitness and exercise, you know, obviously there's a lot of technologies out there right now that are claiming to make, to have really you know, deliver great benefits, but is the same problem exists there as well? And is it, is it that a lot of these things perhaps don't work, you know, whereas we know categorically that this does work. I mean, I can't speak to specific examples, but it is certainly from, you know, like looking to like demonize or villainize. No, but I think, I think the, the, the issues we have in across our field in terms of interpreting work is, um, and, and this is what I think we'll get onto in a minute. And and I guess why I think, I, I think it's such an issue. And, um, I, I think we, um, for a variety of reasons, we overestimate the effects of things. We design studies that are detect, designed to detect um, only effects that are unrealistically large um, because we don't really sort of appreciate um, how small a lot of these effects are. Now, small doesn't mean unimportant um, because, you know, for plenty of things, small effects can, at large enough scale, have a big impact. Um, it depends on what you, you're interested in and why, you know, there, there, there's a lot that goes into the kind of like statistical decision uh, making around, you know, how big a effect is worth caring about. You know, what is the smallest effect we should care about? Um, and if it exists, we should care about finding it. Um, and these are all questions that our field does a very bad job of answering. And I know most other fields do a very bad job of, of answering, well, not even answering, but asking in the first place. And so we design studies based on kind of crappy heuristics and tradition that just replicate the same kind of issues. Um, and this is where like, like um, I mean, this is what I've kind of, I'm kind of moving on to at the moment is um to some extent, we lack a uh, we lack a degree of rigor that is present in other kind of like in the other kind of quote unquote harder sciences, um, and I guess you know science it's a t- we've spoken about this before, and I think and I said before the podcast it's really hard to kind of like um, define like what the hell do we mean by science like in you know um, and there are different kind of like perspectives on it normatively and descriptively like you know so there's this thing that we do that that gets called science and how does it work well that's you know descriptive claim about science and then there are others you know within philosophy of science uh, over years that have um you know discussed more what would be called normative claims like this is how science ought to be done or if you do this then this is called science um and and, and i kind of don't broadly feel like um there is any kind of like one right way way or or at least kind of like formal school that i would sort of fall into but by and large like i think a simple kind of heuristic is is um something that i call a kind of like i i refer to this kind of like epicyclic approach whereby you know we start off or you start off in any given field kind of exploring and just observing kind of um relatively stable phenomena that relatively stable things you can see that seem to be the case and then you know you know if you do this this seems to happen if you do that that seems to happen 
what what kind of like gets you into like more what I guess we would recognize as being kind of the harder sort of like formal science is when you then start trying to come up with explanations for um, those observations and that phenomena. And the real key is when you get to the point where you have a explanation, a theory for why that is the case that in, entails within it certain predictions, certain hypotheses that you can then go out and test to see whether the theory is actually you know, a good explanation or not. Like if your theory were, and this is, you know, you start off essentially working inductively, you observe things, you try to come up with an explanation or, uh, and then once you've got what you think is a good explanation, you test it. If my explanation were true, I would observe this. I go do that. I don't observe this. Oh, well, my explanation, you know, deductively is false then. Um, and that's kind of, I feel, what what most people would you know loosely without kind of wanting to get into the you know a whole debate about um <laughs> philosophy of science what people would agree is like that's kind of like what we think science is in this sort of cyclical sense um and what we seem to be missing is we we don't have particularly like resistance training is a field that is an area that's rife with it, this we've got lots and lots of observations we've got lots and lots of collections of facts we've got very very few explanations or models or um and when we do have them they're at best very loose very vague and kind of verbally expressed we don't have very many kind of like good formal models for um for you know if we um you know have someone do this many sets versus this many sets we should see a difference in results that is of this magnitude um you know, we uh, to, to narrow it down, we can talk about like dose response mod models. Like we do in, in pharmacology, um, they have a very kind of like um, they have a process exactly like what I've just described. Essentially, they have they do their initial kind of stage one, phase one, phase two trials where they're sort of trying to figure out like does it look like this compound has an effect and um, what's the kind of pharmacokinetics of it um, before moving on to well, given what we've observed for it, what could be a good um, model for how response will vary with the doses that we give? And they start to build these kind of statistical or mathematical models of what the dose, what the response should look like given different doses. Um, and then from there, they can use that to say like, well, given the, our model predicts that we should see this response with this dose, this response with that dose, this response with that dose, we can go design studies to test whether that dose response model is good and we can, and then they move on, you know, they move through this kind of like logical um, kind of building an idea, building a model around what they're doing um, and then testing that model. And, and it has to go through such rigor before it gets to the point where, where it can kind of get out where, you know, drug companies are actually allowed to sell this stuff. We just don't do that. Um, and, and we actually, you know, and I think, <laughs> I wonder whether it's because uh, so many people sort of like hate the idea of big pharma and this kind of stuff. And actually, I'll tell you what, like, they do a damn better job than most of what, what the crap that we call science. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, you know, notwithstanding there are biases and, you know, uh, other interests in this, that, that and the other. Um, but I think like, so, so let's, let's take, take an example here. If we take um, like strength um, and, you know, we've got data now from over 100 studies, over 5,000 participants um, and uh, the, the effect for resistance training versus doing nothing is 0.9. Well, if we wanted to compare one resistance training intervention versus another resistance training intervention, it seems almost mad to think we should expect an effect that's bigger than resistance training doing nothing. So by its very nature, we should be expecting smaller effect sizes. Um, and now what, what we're most of the time, what we're interested in is not like comparing two broad interventions. We're interested in like taking a variable that we manipulate within resistance training and comparing like, well, you know, take training to failure, like how close to training to failure should we, should we go? Should we stop at 50% proximity to failure or 70 or 90 or whatever? Um, well, if we know that you know, what the effect is of just resistance training versus nothing, we can start to use that to say like, well, we can build like models of like, well, yeah, let's say it's a linear uh, model. Like, you know, the closer you get, the more you respond or it's curvilinear or you know, whatever. There could be any kind of models you do. If we were, were um, if we use this kind of like 
data-driven approach to build these inductive models and then from that determine well how big what kind of effects should we expect to see and at this point we can ask the question are they big enough to care about because most inevitably they're going to be smaller than we think they're going to be which means that we have to do a bigger study use more resources more time more money etc to do that study are they big enough to warrant even bothering to do the study in the first place um yeah i think we we would be be able to move for, forwards and answer a lot of questions a lot of damn sight better than what we currently have which is lots of small studies over stating the uh, con, you know over not even consciously over claiming because like i say i think a lot of people are unaware of the limitations in, in the field and that's through no fault of their own there's broadly limitations in terms of the way scientists broadly and particularly within our field are trained uh, in terms of research design statistical inference and and so on and and even like you know going back to like philosophy of science like no one gets taught any of that stuff um you might be lucky if you get one slide on uh, in your research methods class on black swans and popper and that's about it um and so yeah it's not anyone's fault i think but we are left with a with a literature that is um filled with kind of you know, to use a phrase I've seen someone else use, nickel and dime studies that like boldly like overstate what can be claimed from them. Um, and this even bleeds into other meta-analyses in the field as well, because I should say like, you know, this meta-analysis that I've done has got over 100 studies in it, 5,000 participants. Like this is a big meta-analysis for our field. Like most meta-analyses, particularly in resistance training, for example, you're lucky if you see like 10, um, 15 studies at most in them. Um, and actually, if you consider the kinds of effect sizes given this data that we should be expecting to see, most of the meta-analyses in our field are already statistically underpowered to detect these kinds of effects as well. Um, so we're really kind of left in a position where I think for, for a lot of things, we're not necessarily either in a position that we can make any strong claims about what intervention works best compared to what other intervention um, or what kind of dose response relationships we should see between manipulating that variable this way or this variable that way. Do you think that's or, all under question after going through this yourself? Do I think Recess it's all... versus one set, frequency, all of those variables are like, like all, the, all the research that's out there at the moment that's kind of suggesting that you know, we should be training a certain way. You think it's all kind of, it's all, it's all, it's all there to be chat. I mean, it should always be challenged, right? That's, that's fine. But you're saying that there's, you, you've, what you've uncovered here is, is saying that maybe it's the, the claims from those studies need to be re-examined. I think, um, I know I'm not so being very specific. So. No, no, no. So I don't necessarily question the results of um, these these previous meta-analyses. You know, some of them have not been done optimally and they're this and the other. But, but quite often, by and large, you know, the, the, the quibbles that we have don't have as big an impact on the overall uh, results and findings as possible. But I do think that in um, interpretation of them is overblown. So even when you go back and look at these meta-analyses that claim to show, you know, greater effects for, you know, you know, more volume or whatever, this and the other. Um, and they may be right. Um, again, like I think they are potentially underpowered for the kinds of effects that we should expect. Um, but, you know, that, that's not to say they are. Um, you, I'd need to go back and, you know, reanalyze that for all of them. But to, but to, to give you kind of like one, one example, um, the two kind of recent uh, meta-analyses on uh, which were published this year, um on training to to failure um again they, they, they did broadly dichotomize the effects um the larger one had 15 studies in it and something like 10 11 something like that uh participants per group um and off the top of my head if i remember rightly if we're looking if let, let's be generous and let's say okay resistance training versus control groups um produces a 0.9 effect for strength let's be generous and say um, training to failure versus not to failure um, produces an effect size of 0.45, like half of what we would expect uh, for resistance training versus control. And I think that's being very generous, um, to be fair. Um, 
most meta-analyses in our field include studies that are quite heterogeneous, um, which is fine. That's absolutely fine. And the, the statistical techniques are designed to deal with that. But it does mean that if there's a lot of heterogeneity, then it reduces the power of the study. Now, for... Um, for that 0.45 effect size for strength, um, if I remember rightly off the top of my he head, you know, a, a, a meta-analysis with about 15 studies, about 13-odd people per group, um, high heterogeneity, has about 87% power, which is pretty good. That's pretty acceptable. So for things like strength outcomes, you know, I wouldn't, I, I, I'd be, if I saw a meta-analysis like that um, and it reported an effect of 0.5, then I'd be like, yeah, okay, that seems, you know, I'm, that seems pretty legit. Um but when you think about hypertrophy in particular, because the effects are so much smaller, again, like they're 0.4-ish, um, if we're generous and say, well, what we're looking for is at best a 0.2 effect size, which is a tiny difference really between any two interventions, well, then that same meta-analysis with the same number of studies, same number of participants, same degree of heterogeneity only has like 28% power or something like that to detect it. So it means that if there really is a 0.2 effect size, you know, with that many studies and that many, uh, that much heterogeneity, you're only going to, you know, have about 28% chance of detecting it if it is really there. Um, and so, so I don't necessarily think that, you know, um, these, these meta-analyses are wrong per se, but what I would also say is most of the time they make, um, statements about which is better, but don't really talk about what that means or how much better and so like i say you know if you go back and you take these effect sizes and you convert them to this common language effect size of what's the probability that if you do this intervention versus that intervention you'd be stronger than someone in that intervention like you start to realize these effects these tiny effect sizes are really just you know that they're, they're, they're i i would question like i'd love to do a study where even where you like almost like a steel man argument around this to say I wonder how much, like, even like, um, you know, those who are really obsessed with this sort of stuff, you know, the, 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 um, the, those who are competing in like powerlifting or those who are, um, you know, um, bodybuilders and stuff like that, who, you know, they, they care about small effects or claim to care about small effects. I wonder if you presented them uh, with these probabilities, how much they would sort of like, how, how important they really think they were, they were. Um, you know, like if you said like, right, if you do this intervention versus that intervention, you've got a 51% chance of uh, being stronger than if you'd done the vice versa or bigger or whatever, like, right. Is that big enough like to care about, particularly if one intervention takes you twice as long or, you know, all the other stuff that has to go into it. So I, I think that we, I think particularly for an individual making a, ch making a choice, um, these these are most of the effects are just so damn small like they're, they're and they're, and at least from my perspective and that's not to say everyone else would agree with this because i know for example others um you know take, take brad uh you know brad's a good good friend and, and and colleague and collaborator but you know i i would say and he would probably agree you know we probably differ in perspective on this so i think he he cares about what seem to be very small effects um now i look at those effects and think this is really not big enough for me to kind of like you know my ears to prick up and for me to care about that um if anything like it's 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 really not big not um so one thing uh you can do do is um in in different statistical approaches, you can look at what's called either equivalence or um, in Bayesian statistics, you, they call it, uh, they determine like a region of practical equivalence. So before you do the study, you um, determine like how big an effect would be big enough for me to think to myself like that's that's bigger than like zero. Like like it, it, if it's close enough to zero for it to pra for all practical purposes basically be zero, then uh, like what's the kind of minimum that you would consider to be to to be you know big enough to care about? Um, I I think it would be interesting to get people to um, answer these questions before doing their studies because it's very easy to look post post hoc and go like, oh, we found a small effect and then then think it must be important. But if we pinned everyone down beforehand and said like, no no no, no you need to you need to say what you think is is important beforehand. You know, put your cards on the table, put your money on you know money on black or whatever, and and figure out like 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 before you do the study, say what you think is big enough to care about. Um, 
I, I think uh, think people would have um, probably higher thresholds than uh, than they would going post hoc and uh, rationalizing the findings. It's hindsight, yeah. They would hindsight bias it, right? They would. Look yeah, I think so. Yeah, I yeah. think so. <laughs> Um, so is this this dovetails really nicely with what you've said in the past on previous podcasts about all roads lead to Rome, you know, do all these different things matter, you know, single joint versus multi-joint frequency, volume, blah, blah, blah. Are you are you still kind of beating that drum in a way and saying that, you know what, the science and I know, look, just to caveat, I know you're all for all that stuff. You're like, you train frequently, you love training. If someone wants to train five times a week and do 20 exercises each time, go for it, whatever. But but, but, but you're saying that in your view, based on what you just said there, that the effect size is shown by all the studies that might explore all those different variables show very little effect if what we're seeing at a macro level is like, you know, 0.4 for hypertrophy and 0.9 for strength. Yeah, I, I mean, like I said, you know, my view on it is that the effects are small enough that they're not worth stressing out about. Um, train to a way that you prefer. I think that, you know, I'm still fairly um, certain to some degree because I, I would... I would I still think that obviously, um, you know, effort to some degree is important, which is not to say that people have to train to failure or maximize effort or anything like that. Because again, we don't really know what the uh, dose response relationship looks like with that. Um, we've not um, we've not looked at it in in a way that will answer that question. Um, just, just on that, because I, I know you sent me that on Facebook about um, some of those graphs you showed me about dose response relationship. Just refresh my memory. What do we know, if anything, about the difference between like 50 or 70% of failure versus 100% failure in terms of outcomes? Um, again, is it is it not huge or, or what, what do we know or do we not know anything about that? Oh, I think we know bugger all about that. Um, I think think the vast majority of study. I think there's maybe one, uh, one study I can think of off the top of my head. Um, that has actually had um, varying degrees of proximity to failure that they have compared. Um, and it's a bit of a weird study. They've used a velocity loss kind of model for that. But um, the vast majority of studies will have a group that train to failure or, and a group that don't train to failure. Um, and the groups that don't train to fail failure train to varying degrees of proximity to failure, often which is not um quantified in any way um so it's difficult to say well how close to failure did they really train um so most of these i, I mean james uh, fish is just led on writing a very short kind of um opinion piece which um which was actually him writing that was what prompted me to do to, to start working on thinking about some of these kind of like modeling uh, approaches and and some of those those figures i sent you will be in that that paper um yeah, like I say, like we have no idea what the model looks like. And so all we know at the moment is, by and large, we've got a lot of studies um, which have training to failure versus not to failure. The training to failure conditions, eh, quite a few of them are pretty close to failure still. Um, so there's still probably, I guess, what you could, you know, any reasonable person would say a reasonably high effort. Um and all we can really say is that well, maybe there's a small difference, um, you know. But depending upon what meta-analysis you look at, look at, and what subgroup comparisons you look at, and things like that, it goes either way. Sometimes it's slightly better um, some, to train to failure. Sometimes it's slightly worse. More often than not, there's not a lot of difference. Um, and so, you know, practically, you kind of left going like, oh, well again, like probably just train with a pretty, you know, I don't know, aim for failure. It doesn't really matter too much if you don't get there. Don't stress out about it again. Um, but I think, again, this is where, like, if we really think this is an import, a worthwhile question to answer, then we need to design studies appropriate to testing that. And given what we know about the effect sizes we should expect, um, you know, and and we could come up with a whole host of different possible models that um, depict what the dose response relationship looks like. So it could be, like I said, it could be linear. Um, you know, for, as you get closer and closer and closer to failure, maybe 
adaptation increases in a linear fashion or it could be like a step function so it's like you know unless you pass some threshold you get no adaptation but once you pass the threshold you get all the adaptation and it doesn't differ you know or maybe it's like a um a, a, a linear log function that kind of like a, a almost not quite a quadratic but it kind of like increases steeply and then sort of starts to plateau out um, or maybe it's a, maybe it is quadratic. Maybe you know it increases up to a certain point, and then once you've passed that point, actually it decreases slightly. And they can't decrease that much because you know there's not really much evidence that training to failure like completely tanks your your results. Um, or maybe you know it's a sigmoid, or maybe it's some sort of like linear and then plateau. You know, there's there's a whole host of different possible models it could be. Um, but we need to propose models. And then we need to think about, well, what studies, do, how should we design studies to test these? You know, what, um, what if this is the model, given what we know about the effects we should expect, if we compared, say, 50 to 100% and the model was this, how many people would we need in our study to be able to have a decent enough power to detect the effect if it was there? And, you know, all of these different things. And some of the stuff I sent over to you was me running some simulations where essentially I kind of... Um, you know, set up these dose response models so that they were, um, as we say, parameterized such that um, they reflected the effects that we should expect given what I've seen in these meta analyses. So it means that, like, you know, basically, um, well, I did a subgroup analysis on the meta analysis where I pulled out only studies where they said they're trained to failure. And the effect size is still about 0.9 for strength. So <laughs> take that as you will. Um, so basically, it means that, like, 0% to failure, well, that's not training, um, compared to 100% to failure in these models produces an effect size of 0.9. So anything in between is what we could expect if that was the case. And, uh, you know, so I ran these simulations basically saying, well, let's imagine we take people who are training this at this point or this point or this point compared to failure and, you know, simulated like sampling randomly from, you know, that population and imagine running like 10,000 randomized controlled trials. And you can see, well, how many of the trials show um, a significant effect when we've got 10 people, 11 people, 12 people, for, you know, different sample sizes. And you start to see that for any kind of, um, if we if we plan our studies based on the effects that we probably should expect, given what we do currently know, to test these models, well, actually, to test them, we need pretty damn big studies to do it. And um, particularly, uh, you know, the, for most of anything that's kind of, you know plausible, I mean, any reasonable person would probably think like, yeah, to some degree, the closer you get to failure, probably to some degree, you get better results. But and it's going to be diminishing the closer you get. Well, you know, you, you're looking at like. 100 plus people um, for, for a lot of um, these comparisons for realistic effects to be able to detect them in the first place. And then you kind of, like I say, you beg the question of, of like, well, <laughs> I, I, I'll say it now, like I've not got the energy or, or, or inclination to run those, those, those kinds of studies going for, forwards. Like, Christ, running randomized controlled trials is bloody hard and getting that many people to do it. I can't imagine anyone would want to fund it. Um, so... I can tell you now, I'm not running those studies. <laughs> but if, if as a community, people think it's important and it's important enough to warrant that resource, then the options we have are either people pool resources and do these big collaborative kind of studies where we have multiple labs all collecting data, you increase the sample sizes. Another option is to say like, well, that's hard to do logistically. It's hard to coordinate. You know, scientists are like cats. Like the, it was like herding cats. It's really hard to get them to do what you want. Um, maybe what we do is we say like, right, well, we just, for the studies we do do that are small, we just don't make any bold claims out of them. We almost kind of like do them and we contribute the data openly and publicly such that at some point in the future, someone can turn around and go like, right, we've got a lot of studies on this stuff now and we can start to do, because you can do, again, like meta-analyses are flexible approaches to analysis. You can do meta-analytic dose response modeling, um, but you need the right kind of studies and data to put into the, into the sausage machine. <laughs> um, you know, or we just say, well, I I know maybe there's more important things to, to spend our time looking at. Uh, fascinating. James, I just aware of time, but you know, a podcast review wouldn't be the same if we didn't hear about your latest training <laughs> regime. Now, actually, if you've got some time, can you run over or you got hard stop at the, the half hour mark? 
Uh, I'm pretty flexible, mate. Today, like the missus has gone to work, so um, cool. I'm, I'm, I'm good. Cool, me too. And so I've got two, two questions actually. One, I just wanted to hear, and I know this might not have changed that much, but you did say you disagree with some of the stuff you said in the past, which is interesting. So, first question would be, what would your guidelines look like now for most people who want to get the best results from from their exercise? What would the guidelines be these days? I mean, honestly, for those kinds of questions, I probably haven't changed my mind, really. Like, I still do really think, you know, like something pretty basic, um, you know, a handful of multi-joint movements for upper body, you know, push-pull, lower body, you know, maybe some sort of like trunk movement um, It is, you know, once or twice a week, single set, you know, push to fa- failure as close as you can. It's probably good enough uh, for most most people. Um do you know, actually, like, as I'm saying this, this is an interesting, uh, another interesting uh, can of worms as well, though. So, um, I mean, you might have seen that we've recently done a meta-analysis on supervision effects as well. Yes. Um, and uh, there does seem to be, at least for strength, um, there's really not much much we can say about other outcomes, but at least for strength, there does seem to be a small effect for um, for supervision compared to no supervision um and it's within reason like what we would you know if if resistance training versus no resistance training produces a 0.9 well what we found was resistance training with supervision versus no supervision produces about a 0.4 which again like like i said like maybe that's pretty reasonable it's like just just less than half of what of what you get from just resistance training on it you know um compared to control um but um i i kind of uh, i kind of laughed myself i i i I've I've been thinking a little bit more about this um, because I think actually going back to what what I um, said earlier, another approach we have to potentially um, this kind of stuff is to subtly change the questions we're asking as well, um, which I think also makes them more in line with what we're talking about now. So what I mean by that is, you know, we do all these studies where we'll have um, a particular protocol that's compared to another protocol when it's done under supervised conditions, blah, 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 all this kind of stuff. And then what we do is, um, and everyone does this, you know, they'll take those studies and then they'll talk about what people should do. The vast majority of people will then go do those things in the gym, on their own, you know, whatever. Like, and we don't know the extent to which the effect sizes that we see under those idealized lab conditions translate to those recommendations out in the real world where people are doing them out out there. Um, Now, we've spoken about this efficacy versus effectiveness kind of question first place, which is what I'm getting to. It was another head spin podcast. (laughs) Yeah. And so because what we tend, I mean, what you tend to see, like, you know, the supervision uh, thing is is an uh, an example. And I actually think we'd see um, even more of a leaking of that kind of effect size if we were to do it out in the real world. Um, But I think, you know, that is actually one way where we could, in theory, collect more people if instead what we did is we've recruited people virtually and we gave them programs to go do um, and fo- follow. And um, and that's more like what we what we've put end up doing with the results of our studies anyway. We make these broad recommendations that we expect people to go go follow, but the results are specific to, well, we did it here in this lab with me supervising it or Luke supervising it or his staff or whatever, um, which may not be the same, same sort of thing. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so I sometimes think, um, uh, to give you another example as well, I'm, I'm working on a inter- a really interesting meta-analysis with Israel Halperin again at the moment. Um, and we did one recently looking at, um, how good people are at predicting proximity to failure and, and echoed the kind of findings from the studies we've done in our lab. Um, but with, we're looking at the moment at um, self-selected loads. So we're looking at studies where people have been allowed to pick what loads they train with. And we're, we're looking at, well, what do people select as the percentage of their 1RM? Um, but a small handful of those studies um, have um, explored, well, if you get people in and, and ask them to select a load and do as many reps as they want, and, we, and the only instruction they get given are, um, you know, for a good strength workout. So people come into the lab and they say, right, pick a load, do as many reps as you as you want um, for what you think would give you a good strength workout. Um, that's really interesting because what we what um, I've been able to then do is compare um, the number the loads that they pick and the number of reps they do compared to typically 
how many reps people do do to failure with those loads. And uh, it's very interesting that people pick, um, you know, loads ranging from 50 up to, you know, 80% of their 1RM. And on average, everyone does about 15 reps, irrespective of what load they pick. So people who are picking low loads are probably training way further from failure than those who are picking heavier loads in that case. So as I was saying that recommendation, I was thinking to myself, well, you know, th- this is why I always add in the kind of like caveat of, of you know, aim for failure, because at the moment we do think I, I'm pretty, again, it's one of those things I sort of believe, but I'm still not willing to sort of like put my foot down and say, I like, know definitely it's the most important thing. I think it kind of makes sense that, that you know, you have to at least, put some effort into it yeah, yeah. to get it's anything just, out it's just a catch-all like recommendation right it's just a guarantee exactly exactly and and it, it's like i say you know no at best we know that it's not going to tank your you're going to get worse results yeah. from doing it um or at least not meaningfully worse results even if like going back to those models i talked about let's say it is a quadratic model and you get slightly less yeah. if you get if you actually hit failure well the effects are so damn tiny that like it even if you did do that, like what you're losing is probably less than you can even notice. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so my, my recommendations are pretty are, are pretty similar, and it's pretty much what I do do still. You know, I still basically do the same sort of routine and have done for years. Yeah, and what is that currently? Let's just because I know that people <laughs> tuning in for the first time, even me, like I I'm always even if you said exactly the same thing, I just want to know what your workouts are like at the moment. Sure, and I've, I'm not using Instagram <laughs> so much anymore, so I've not That's been posting it. any videos or anything. Um, yeah, no. So I train today. Um, I'm still doing sort of like Monday, Wednesday, and sometimes Saturdays. But like I said, I'm I'm back to playing golf now. So if I play golf on a Saturday, I tend not to train. Um, and but Mondays and Wednesdays at least I'll do you know my usual kind of like body weight routine. So still do a sort of A B routine more for variation and just interest than anything else. And so today what did I do? Um, I did you know neutral sort of push ups to failure. Um, some uh, a set of pull ups to failure. I've got the um, uh, oh what's the the I've forgotten the brand name. The the kind of grippy handles that you can kind of that are um, yeah, for the pull ups. Yeah, and I've completely okay. forgotten the brand name now. Um, Don't worry. Anyway, yeah, it's basically just a set of pull-ups to failure. I did a wall sit, sit um, to failure, superset into bodyweight squats to failure, dips, uh, bodyweight rows, and then a you know a plank and um, and the uh, uh, McGill, McGill crunches that I've described before, which are kind of like a very sort of like um, short range of motion kind of um, trunk flexion movement with one knee flexed. Um, and then Wednesday, I'll probably do essentially the same routine, but, you know, just subtly different exercises. So I'll do a wide grip uh, um, push-up. I'll do a wide grip pull-up, a wide grip pronated pull-up. I'll do um, single leg, um, like, uh, split squats um, to failure into maybe, like, a single leg kind of hip extension to failure, um, like a kind of um, hip thrust type movement. Um, and then, yeah, like a, like a narrow grip push-up, narrow grip supinated pull-ups and um yeah like some side planks or something something like that and then on the saturday i still keep that as my kind of like because i've collected i've managed to collect like a number of toys um over time so uh recently um fisher gave it to me because he's got like a really fancy setup in his garage now um makes my kind of like a garden gym look like even more spit and sawdust than it was uh, but he had like a, a pulley cable so um i've got that so i can do you know like cable curls and like push downs and things like that and straight on arm, arm press oh, down single and, joint stuff yeah just for i mean i've always like done some of that on like uh the saturday anyway because you know i'll do like a set of easy bar curls or you know whatever um and yeah i just i just toy around so actually did, i actually i trained yesterday and i trained today because i was going to train on saturday um but something got in the way so i trained yesterday and did um like dumbbell weighted drop set of pull-ups dips um and then did um like a wall sit with holding the dumbbells um and also some stiff leg deadlifts with the dumbbells as well um and then i did train again today um so i did kind of train back to back back with that um but 
I, the reason I trained yesterday is because I wasn't going to train today because I was supposed to be playing golf this morning <laughs> and uh, my alarm didn't go off. So I missed my tea time. So I thought, I'll sort it, I'll train. <laughs> so hang on, you trained two days in a row. Is that, is that yeah. <laughs> and why would you do that? And, and, and Kel Surprise, I haven't died. <laughs> yeah, but wh- why would you do that? Just because you want to. Yeah, just I just felt like, like it. Like, and it, and and I wanted to get back onto my kind of Monday Wednesday routine. So I thought I'd just train today and train on Wednesday, and uh, and that'll be that. And I'm not sure I'm going to get the chance to train on Saturday this week um, because I'm we're visiting friends. So it depends on whether I'll have time to get a workout in before we go or not. Now, maybe this is a, a one for another podcast where we can just have like a bro conversation about all this stuff, because I, I just think it's so interesting, like how your own perspective when your training's changed. So like, what, what, why, why do you train the way you do? Like in the frequency, is it, you know, you just sit there about, oh, I want to train on Saturday to get it in before X, Y, and Z. It's like, is it because it makes the way it makes you feel? Is it, you know, I... I will be totally honest if, if you don't want to be so vulnerable when I love working out because I love the way I look after I work out. I love standing in front of the mirror and being like, whoa, look at my blood gorged lean physique, you know, um, and, and, you know, it makes me feel good temporarily. And it's also, it's also got that, that feeling that we all love that just the, the way your muscles feel, the way your body feels after the workout, the way you, I know for some people feel very creative, right? So what is it for you? All those things. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's always been for me, um, uh, and I think I've come around more to more to realizing like this is the primary kind of thing thing for me. Be- partly because of the knowledge I just have of like how little a lot of it really matters to the things I really thought I, I thought I used to care about, you know. Because if I'm honest, like I haven't, been, I'm not any stronger and I'm not any more muscular than I was ten years ago. Um, despite what I've done, done, I've trained a variety of ways over that time, and it, and it makes no bloody different difference, or at least not in any noticeable way. You know, again, yeah, like I know if I wanted to, you know, rack my deadlift one RM up, I need to go practice that move, but I still know I can walk in and deadlift more than most dudes in the gym anyway. Um, so it, very little has, has changed, and um, I. Uh, it's funny. So uh, there's a guy called Mladen Jovanovic um, who um, who is a uh, he, he's he's a Marmite individual uh, to a lot of people, um, and he's, he's a very clever dude. But he's, he's he could be a bit of a shit poster sometimes. And yeah, you remember the old um, kind of. Uh, the memes of the the dude like the hipster dude with the kind of like or not hipster dude like the the strong jawed guy with the beard and the blonde hair and stuff and then there's like the kind of like whiny uh troll sort of like um yeah, yeah. face that they ever had and again he posted like like this this which like resonated with me um which was like the the whiny guy sort of saying like like oh no you've got to train an evidence-based and maximize your you know protein synthesis and have this much protein afterwards and you know this is why i go to the gym and this that, and the other and then the beard dude's just like like oh i train because i get to see my mates and uh you know and i uh and i like lifting heavy things and you know and i feel strong and this that, and the other and it was just, and he put like a science uh or, or phenomenology great it, it is more than science in this respect and i, and I really vibe with that i was like do you know what like yeah like I, I, you know i can spin a bullshit yarn about like oh you know i train this way because it optimizes this that and the other and it's like i i'm i'm over trying to com- like that doesn't convince me and it's not going to convince any, anyone else now no i train because i like it and it's always been i mean we spoke probably years ago about you know why did i get into this stuff in the first place and honestly it was from watching things like dragon ball z and stuff like that and i always had this kind of like mentality of um like pushing myself and challenging myself and it always felt very it was almost kind of like my kind of like meditative um you know approach was to put myself and my body like I like push it to its limits um and I like that it is a it's a, a um it's a practical and a you know pragmatic and kind of just very sort of like logistically feasible way of doing that on a regular basis and sort of yeah like feel, feeling my body like knowing i can still do this shit and um do you know what like that is that is i think one of the main drivers for most of us actually although we don't always say it like for me it is like what am i made of can i do this you know it's like it's like the ultimate test it's like I don't know anyone but you, James, who could probably actually go to failure on a wall sit. Like, I just don't know people that can do that. And I can't do it. But 
sometimes I might get close and then I might fail in a squat, for instance. And it's just, it's just for me, it's like self-discipline. It's like, what, like, who are you? You know, I, I say that to you when I train them, I say one of my little coaching idiosyncrasies is I'll say to people like, this is who you are right now. Like, this is it. Like, this is like, who are you? Who are you, James? Like, come on. Like, this is, you're revealing yourself to me right now. And it, it's amazing how stuff like that, like, really motivates some people, right? Others, it doesn't. You have to understand people are different. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, that's a huge thing for me. It's like, um, it's like, a, like you're trying to prove something to yourself or prove something to the world. It's, and it goes back to maybe the mindfulness of meditation for sure. It's like being present with your body and each, during each movement and yeah, stuff that I rarely talk about on this podcast. Although I did do the mindfulness one recently with um, Andre and Philip. I don't know if you saw that, but that was all about their book, yeah. Mindful Fitness. Um, yeah. So no, it is, it, that stuff really does resonate with me. Anything else you want to, before we wrap up, James, any other parting thoughts? Um, any other parting thoughts? I don't know. Just enjoy training. Enjoy, enjoy. Like, like I, I'm, 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 I'm becoming more and more sort of like laid back over the over the years. Um, yeah, don't get don't get caught up in all the bullshit like nitpicking and argue, arguments, particularly in this community. <laughs> it's uh, there's more important things to do, like spend time with loved ones, try and get your golf handicap down. <laughs> <laughs> What's your handicap be, be, these days? Oh, it's uh, so I used to be a fairly good golfer. Like I, I was, I was pushing like I went 15 years ago. I was looking to sort of like get under 10 uh, handicap and now I'm playing off about 24, but I haven't played in 15 years. And um, it's, it is depressing because, uh, well, it's not depressing. The the thing I've, I quite like about it is it's a, um, it's a sport that I know I can continue. I can come back and get better at despite getting older um whereas like you know i, I kind of That's fell out of running track again because i realized like all i'm doing is like <laughs> trying to get slow uh, 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 you know slow down uh, uh, the amount i'm slowing down like, <laughs> over time and, and picking up injuries along the way um but yeah no golf is interesting because there's still um i, I think for me it's getting back the, the level of consistency because there are some sometimes i can play and i'm like like shit this is like like this is, I mean, this is better than I used to play. And then like, but then it's like the swings like of like performance are so big. <laughs> Just not got the consistency yet. Yeah. You know what? Like I've always, I've never been that interested in golf. I have played. Um, I'm not particularly good, uh, but, but I've never, it's never been something I thought I would, you know, try and explore and, and, and get into. But the way you described it there, the way it's like something you can actually get better with age. I think that's really interesting, you know, because there's not a lot of sports you can say that for. Maybe there are a few others, maybe darts, pool. I don't know. Maybe there's others, <laughs> uh, but that's actually quite a bit of an incentive. So I might, uh, I might explore it someday for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. It's good. And like for me as well, again, going back to this kind of, um, I mean, I get the, the missus de- uh, likes me going to play golf uh, because I, I I'm, you know, I, I get very, very caught up in my work and I find it very, I, I do struggle sometimes to kind of like, particularly with lockdown as well, because, you know, this this space has become like my office. And, you know, I, I imagine you maybe find a similar sort of thing, like where I used to, you know, leave home and go to work. I now like work is here. And so it's very hard to switch off. It's very hard to kind of like transition from like, oh, I'm working now to I'm now at home time. And um, yeah, so she uh I, I play with my brother and i play with some friends and i always come back and she she would say um you know oh any, any gossip you know any 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 interesting news and i'd be like no and she'd be like, well what do you talk about and i was like golf like we're playing golf we talk about like golf <laughs> and and a few after a few times of saying that she was like so you literally just play golf and talk about golf i was like yeah she was like oh so you don't think about work or anything i was like no, I don't actually. Like I literally spend four hours not thinking about anything other than what I'm doing, which is, which suddenly was like a realization of like, wow, that's so nice. Like, like it's so, so I'm trying to keep like at least one morning a week where I can uh, get out on the course and just, uh, you know, as long as the weather's not terrible. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, You've inspired me James to um, maybe try and reach out to you to schedule a podcast more about these types of subjects. Cause I love the science, but also love talking to you about this stuff as well. Um, So James, thank you so much for 
taking the time really good to catch up um got real heavy at the start definitely gonna have to re-listen to that definitely made myself look like a bit before but that's okay because i suspect there's a cohort of people listening who are in the same boat as me and maybe they appreciated me asking silly questions and you to have to uh explain the same thing in four different ways five to, you know so that we can all understand it um and there are others who i'm sure understood it from the get-go uh, but no really fun podcast and the uh, best way for people to connect with you or find out more about you uh, definitely um, Twitter or, or my um, institutional email. So I, I, I'm I'm not really on Facebook or Instagram a- anymore. I mean, I, I've still got my, my Facebook account is actually just private now. Like, like I, I just don't use it at all. Um, but <laughs> annoyingly, because it's tied to so many other accounts, like I didn't want to like shut it down, um, particularly because it's like tied to my uh, like because Facebook own Oculus, like I would have to set up a new profile <laughs> for my damn VR headset if I if I uh, shut it down. So no, yeah, Twitter is um, is m- social media that I'm mainly active on. So it's at James Steele, I I, um, and then my yeah institutional email James at Solent uk is probably the. Um, if people want to reach out and, and have any questions and um and i should say like you know the the, the stuff we covered is probably it's difficult stuff to cover just verbally as well because like i've said like you know yeah. um will this be on youtube it will be yes oh cool yeah. so some people might see my attempts at kind of like trying to use visual aids of my hands but uh, for well, those is who there, are there to- any links any links that i can send people to to help the cohen I mean, this is what- thing you mentioned oh yeah so i sent you over the link to yeah. um uh, to the uh, our psychologist uh, website with some visualizations of uh, the effect sizes that we we're talking about, and and that's a really useful thing for people to play with to kind of see like what you know what does a 0.9 effect size look like, and and it gives all of the conversions like the common language effect size, like yep. I said, and and those sorts of things. Um, I think um, if people keep an eye out on my ResearchGate profile, um, hopefully over at some point over the next few months, um, the a preprint of the tutorial paper um, on meta-analysis of variation that I mentioned will be available. And, and like I said, because the, these are topics that are, that are they're not only difficult for people who are not researchers and, you know, work in this area, they are difficult for, um, you know, I'm going to pick on Fisher, um, but like he, he, this is difficult stuff for him as well. I, I mean, that's why, why he lets me do it all now. Um, but but uh, you know, it's not it's not easy um, stuff to to wrap your head around. And so we're going to try and write the paper in a way that is um, hopefully really easy to for people to follow. Uses a lot of visual aids to sort of because I'm really a visual learner with statistics as well. Anyway, like you know, I got to the point now where I can read the no- mathematical notation and it will make sense. But it, you know, when I first get in- encountered this stuff, I like and go, "What the hell does that mean?" And then vi- visualizing what the data and what the statistical models actually mean and look like suddenly clicks for me. So you know, these these kinds of visualizations uh, for statistical concepts, I think, are really really valuable. Yeah, and the um, what we'll do is we'll link up the uh, Cohen's D uh, uh, website you sent me. So it's our psych. So this is really for my editors. rpsychologist dot com forward slash Cohen C O H E N D. We'll get that linked up as well as the other things you mentioned about ResearchGate. Awesome, good stuff, James and. Um, Everyone listening to the podcast, if you want to find the blog post, please go to highintensitybusiness.com. Search for episode 340. And until next time, thank you very much for listening. This episode is brought to you by ARX. You want to be a successful strength training studio owner. The problem is you aren't able to deliver the safest, most efficient and effective workouts making it harder for you to attract and retain clients, which makes you feel frustrated. I understand that it can be difficult to differentiate your business without the right tools. ARX's Breakthrough Adaptive Resistance Technology uses patented motorized resistance and computer software to give you and your clients the perfect workout every single time. BioFit founder John Zarbock says that ARX is clearly the superior tool to deliver the exercise stimulus. My clients are seeing insane improvements in weeks, not months. I could not fathom running my business without ARX. So here's how you get started. Number one, go to arxfit.com forward slash HIB to get $500 off your ARX machines. Number two, book a call with the ARX sales team. 
And number three, learn how Airx can help you grow your strength training business. Go to airxfit.com forward slash HIB so you can stop struggling to attract and retain clients and start to grow your strength training business with confidence. 